Hello and welcome to the third and final video lesson of First Corinthians. Um, last time we got through chapter 11 and uh, this time we're going to try to finish everything up. Now one of the things you want to make sure without all of Paul's letters to realize is you got to know the historical situation. Like I kind of give you a little historical blurb of the city and Paul's time in the city. Um, you have to know that, but also it is good to be able to understand, you know, tracing the argument of any given letter, in this case 1 Corinthians. Understand how the letter plays out and how it sets up and how Paul moves from one point to the next, you know, just tracing the argument all the way through. Because if you do that, if you know the historical background of his time in the city and the city itself, and you know something about <clears throat> that, then when you read his letters, you can tease out a little more nuance and context to, to understand what he's actually addressing. And thus far in Corinthians, what we've done is basically we've kind of broken it up into chunks. Chapters 1 through 4 is he's addressing the apparent uh, divisions that are creeping up in the <clears throat> uh, Corinthian church. And when you put it all together, those first four chapters... What he's, if you want to focus on, what he's focusing on is he's pointing them to the heart of his gospel message, which is a crucified Christ. And he emphasizes that that message is foolishness to Greek philosophers, and it's an absolute scandal, stumbling block to his fellow Jews. And therefore, when you realize that, um, that nobody likes that message... <laughs> And that it's utterly foolish in the eyes of the world, because he's putting Jewish scribes and Greek philosophers up on one side and believers on the other. Um, it kind of keeps you humble, because you're believing, you're putting your faith in a crucified Messiah. And as Paul points out in uh, these first four chapters, God chooses the weak and, weak and foolish things of the world. That means you. So there's no need to get a big head. You are weak, you are foolish, you are putting your faith in a weak and foolish message but it's only weak and foolish compared uh, in the eyes of the world, uh, whether it's Greek philosophy or, uh, or Judaism. It's that oxymoronic message is true wisdom and true power of the Spirit. That's the first four chapters. Then what we did is we looked at chapters 5 through 7 in which he starts to address some specific issues that the Corinthian church was dealing with. One involved a man who was sleeping with his mother-in-law, one involved lawsuits among believers, uh, and then there was apparently some Corinthian Christians who said, hey, Paul says we're free in Christ. We can go to the pagan temples and have sex with prostitutes. Um, Paul has to correct their view a little bit on that. And then he talks about uh, the issues of being married and single and all that. That's in chapter 7 as well. Then we looked at, the next big chunk was really 8 through 10. Because 8 through 10 as a whole, as we looked at last time, uh, deals specifically with two issues. Is it okay for Christians to eat idle food, which means food that is now in the marketplace, in the Walmart grocery sections of Corinth, even though that meat has had been butchered and passed through pagan temples? Is it okay to eat that meat? And to that, Paul basically says, yeah, it's just meat. You, you know it's just meat. You can totally eat it. With one caveat. Caveat. Caveat? Meaning you might know that, but there might be somebody else, uh, what he calls a weaker brother, a weaker Christian, um, meaning like a Jew, who a Jewish Christian who all his life, Jews, do not eat meat that is passed through pagan temples. And so that person might have a real problem with it. So Paul says, even though you're free to eat it and you know it's just meat, don't scandalize that brother by eating that meat in front of them. It's it's just meat. You shouldn't you shouldn't be hung up. Even though they had, if, if somebody else hang, has a hang up over it, it shouldn't be a hang up for you to where you have to eat it in any way and you know offend that person. Also, even though it's just meat, if you go to a pagan's house, a pagan friend, and they offer you meat and it's no big deal, eat it. But if that pagan says, hey, you know, this was sacrificed to Zeus, uh, 
that tells you that in their mind, it's a big deal. So it's best that you not eat that meat, not to, you know, put any obstacle in front of sharing the gospel. And so that's Paul's first answer in order to, in, in regards to um, eating meat that has passed through pagan temples that you now buy in the marketplace. The second issue is, were Christians, could Christians go to the pagan temples and take part in the social meals and whatnot in the pagan temples? And that, Paul says, absolutely not. Because even though there is no such thing as other gods, Paul points out that there is a deeper reality that ultimately pagan worship and pagan gods, even though those gods are nothing, there's an underlying demonic power to, to them. So you cannot go share a meal in the temple of Aphrodite and then share the Lord's Supper in church. You can't do it. And so that's his basic point. With that, then <clears throat> what we were able to get to in the last session was starting in chapter 11, which is kind of, if you look on the chart I gave you, I have chapter 11 through 14 as its own little span of a teaching, which <clears throat> hopefully you can kind of see. After talking about not eating in pagan temples, because um, you, you, you should eat at the table of Christ, that acts as kind of a transition to what comes next, and that is, um, even though we don't fully understand it, uh, basically it worship practices in the church. And we got into that. The first part of chapter 11 deals with head coverings. Nobody's quite sure what the angels are have to do with that. But in any case, we talked about how it might have to something to do with um, men taking on the men's roles, women taking on the women's roles, not uh, confusing people. Um, but there, his Paul's point is, whatever that means, is uh, men and women need each other, they complement each other, but they need to be distinct as men and women, and somehow that involves how they worship. Um, then he gets to specifically the, work, the, the communion itself, and like we talked about last time, it is an actual meal, and you can kind of see this, what he says in 11, 17, and 34, is kind of contrasting with <clears throat> that talk he just did about sharing a meal in the temple. And the problem with the Corinthian believers, apparently, is when they came for a meal, it wasn't just a bread and cup, um, is some of the, the poor believers weren't getting food. They weren't getting to eat the meal. And the rich people would just come and stuff themselves. And so Paul makes a point that when you share the Lord's Supper, everybody needs to be fed. If you don't do that, if you don't discern the body, i.e. the body of believers, uh, you're eating and drinking damnation on yourself. You're not really having communion and unity. So, that's chapter 11. Now, uh, chapters 12 and 13, I can go through really quickly, because when you read them, they're really straightforward. Chapter 12 comes out of that talk of community, communion and unity. In chapter 12, he then turns his attention, again, in the context of church worship and stuff, um, he turns his attention in chapter 12 to various spiritual gifts. And his point is very simple when you read chapter 12. Every person in the body of Christ is a different body part, metaphorically speaking. Everybody has their own giftings. Everybody has their own talents. And that's fine. Nobody has to do the same thing. That's the talk of using the imagery of the body of Christ. N not everybody is an, is an ear. Not everybody is a foot. Um, and yes, there are some body parts that get more, you know, airtime than others, you know, if you're an appendix, you're not going to really get much glory, but you're, you know, whatever. Um, and his point is very simple. Everybody is spiritually gifted in various ways, and that's great. You should all use your gifts as best you can to build up the body of Christ. And what I would say in my personal experience is I, I think I'm a fairly good teacher. I, I think I'm pretty good at taking complicated stuff and making it clear and understandable. That's kind of a gift, that I've and I've developed it. Um, at the same time, you would not want me to be your pastor, or you would not want to come to me if you were having trouble with your, you know, boyfriend or girlfriend or stuffing something, because even though I care, <laughs> I'm just not a good counselor kind of person. Um, that's not my gift. <laughs> 
And so, and that's okay. Now, um, with that, in chapter 12, um, along with that, he talks about, among some of the spiritual gifts, in the early church, it was, they were charismatic churches. They had um, prophesying and speaking in tongues. Um, and Paul's point is, even those which on the out, outwardly seem really, you know, wow, I went to Assemblies of God Church and the people who spoke in tongues, you kind of like, that's amazing. Um, but his point is, even that is just one of the many other gifts. They're all vital and needed to the body of Christ. So, that's chapter 12. Then we get to chapter 13, which is the famous love chapter that is often quoted in weddings and all that stuff. Um, but I want you to look at chapter, chapter 13 in light of everything he's been saying in 1 Corinthians. Everything he's been saying in 1 Corinthians has to do with dealing with uh, healing divisions, building up the church, the unity and communion of the church. And then when he gets to the spiritual gifts, how they all should be used for the unity and building up of the body of Christ. And then in that context, he brings up the love chapter. And the point is, when you read it, it's only like, what, 13 verses. Um, he starts off by, again, it links to what he's just talked about, spiritual gifts. He begins with saying, If I speak in tongues of men and angels but have not love, I'm a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. What's his point? You can have all the cool spiritual gifts, but unless you live it out in love toward other people, it ain't worth much. That's the context that he's talking about in chapter 13, is any gift you have has to be done in a spirit of love for others, to build each other up. Now, the one thing I do want to point out that's really important in chapter 13 is this talk starting in verse 8. He says, Love never ends. As for prophecies, they will pass away. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part and prophesy in part. But when the perfect comes, the partial will pass away. Um, and then he later says in verse 12, uh, For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now only in, we know in part, but then we shall know fully, even as I am fully known. What does that mean? <clears throat> that gets back to uh, that fundamental worldview that um, the early church had, that, that was a kind of a variation of the Jewish worldview. And you have to realize this if you want to understand what he's talking about, not just here, but throughout his letters. Remember, the Jewish worldview was they were living in the old age that was dominated by sin, death, foreign oppression, all that bad stuff. And they were expecting the Messiah to come like a lightning bolt, turn the page, there would be a resurrection of the dead, the Spirit would be poured out, and then all of a sudden, oh, the new messianic age where everything was super awesome. Eternal life, the Spirit, healing, free from foreign oppression, all that stuff. Boom, boom. But the Christian uh, proclamation tweaked that Jewish worldview, and it said, we are living in the old age, the Messiah has come, He's he started to establish the kingdom of God. The Spirit has been poured out. And then the church is living in between the times. The church is living in that, nobody saw it coming, an in-between time where they're living in the old age, but they have a glimpse of the kingdom of God, a glimpse of the life to come. They've been given the Holy Spirit in part. And so Paul is saying all this stuff, the spiritual gifts, everything, is in part. And eventually when Christ comes and the kingdom of God is fully consummated and established, you won't need to speak in tongues. You won't need to prophesy because then you'll have reached your goal. And so that is the context of what he's talking about in chapter 13. And the way you get from seeing in part and hearing in part and knowing in part and spiritual gifts and all that stuff to the consummation of the kingdom of God, the avenue of that is living it out in love. And that's why he emphasizes uh, love here. Not, I mean, spiritual gifts are great, but you have to do them in a spirit of love because that's what never fails. That's what leads you to full, uh, the full maturation, the full per per perfection of um, the coming kingdom of God. Okay, he's not done yet because now he turns in chapter 14 to more specific things regarding prophecy and speaking in tongues. Now, again, unless you've growing up in an Assemblies of God charismatic church, this is going to sound kind of um, odd. Okay, when it comes to chapter 14, 
uh, we're not going to go into detail about 1 through 25. What that is, basically, is he is giving directions on um, the proper way that speaking in tongues and prophesying should happen within the church service. You have to remember that in the early church, Pauline churches, they were charis what we call charismatic. They had these things going on. Um, and so Paul's point in chapter 14 is he wants to encourage speaking in tongues and prophesying in the church worship service, but he wants to emphasize it has to be done in an orderly manner. And that brings us to a very interesting, controversial two verses. Um, if you look at verses 26 to 39, Paul emphasizes that there must be order in the church worship, whether it's speaking in tongues or prophesying, whatnot. The controversy comes with verses 34 and 35. It says, um, really it begins with the end of 33. As in all the churches of the saints, the women should be kept in silent in the churches, for they are not permitted to speak, but should be in submission, as the law also says. If there is anything they desire to learn, let them ask their husbands at home, for it is shameful for a woman to speak in church. Then it, in 36, or was it from you that the word of God came, or you the only ones it had reached? Etc., etc., etc. Now the question becomes, what's going on with these two verses, 34 and 35? Um, it makes Paul sound like quite the misogynist. You know, women, shh, don't say anything in church. Um, but the problem with those verses is there is a question of whether or not those verses belong in the letter, whether or not Paul really wrote those verses or were they inserted later on. Now, there's a textual argument for it, and then there's a logical coherent argument for it. I'm going to try to explain it very briefly. Um, all our, the first thing to note is all our manuscripts, all the Greek manuscripts we have, have those verses in there somewhere. All the Western manuscripts before 400 AD have those verses come after verse 40. So verses 34 and 35 come at the end of the chapter in some of our earliest manuscripts in the West. Okay, In the Eastern Church, those verses are where we find them in our Bibles today. Okay, So the question becomes, why do these verses get moved around? Um, that's a very odd thing. It, should, it tells the textual critic, okay, there, there's something weird about these verses. Normally, verses don't get moved around at random. Um, one of the clues, and this is uh, an argument that Gordon Fee makes, because he's a textual critic, um, <clears throat> he notes that um, in one bilingual manuscript that we have, um, verses 34 and 35 are found at the end of the chapter, but they're found with a little asterisk. And that oftentimes is that asterisk is a scribal notation that indicates that they got these verses from the margin of the co of the work they're copying. Because a lot of times they're, when they don't have copy machines, you know, they copy by hand. And so when they're copying a manuscript, a lot of times there were like notes and whatnot written in the margins of the older manuscript. And so sometimes what the scribes would do is when they're copying the text, they would take what they read in the manuscript to preserve it, they would put it like at the end of the chapter with an asterisk. And basically that asterisk was kind of saying, this, these verses or this note was in the margin, but it's not part of the original letter. I'm just putting it at the end of this chapter. Now, Gordon Fee believes that these two verses, 34 and 35, was originally a note somebody wrote in a manu in the side, in the, in the column, in the marginal gloss of, an early manuscript, that, and at some point that note got put into the manuscript, and at some point then the asterisk was lost, and then it just found its way into 1 Corinthians, and it's not part of the original letter. Um, and so that is the textual argument, that those verses might not be part of the original letter. Um, there's also internal problems with those verses. 
First off, if those verses came from Paul, it totally contradicts earlier stuff he said in the letter, where he talks, for example, in verse chapter 11, when he talks about women who are praying and prophesying in church, should he have their head covers? If in chapter 11 he's talking about women praying and prophesying in church, why would he then all of a sudden say here, women can't speak at all in church ever? It doesn't make sense. And so right there, that's a clue that maybe these verses don't fit in the context of the letter. Okay? Um, let me see here. Uh, okay. Another uh, thing has to do with punctuation. What do you do with verse 36? Long story short, if you take those verses out, okay, basically what happens... Um, take the verses 34 and 35, and plus the, 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 the last part of 33, basically. The, the part that starts, as in all the churches of the saints, that whole section. If you take that out, the flow of the argument in chapter 14 makes perfect sense. Because up to this point, up to 33, what's Paul talking about? You can speak in tongues, you can prophesy, just make sure you do it in order. And all of a sudden, verses 34 and 35 seem to stick out like a sore thumb. It has nothing to do with orderly worship. It's just, women, be, be crushed. Okay? But if you take those verses out, the text reads like this, um, starting in verse 32. The spirit of the prophets are subject to the control of the prophets, for God is not a God of order, disorder, but of peace. Verse 36. Or did the word of God originate with you? Are you the only people it has reached? What is going on there is if you take those verses out, what Paul seems to be saying is speaking in tongues and prophesying needs to be done in an orderly way. This is the way, for God is a God of order, not of, God, God is not a God of disorder, but of peace. Then, he's turning it on to the Corinthians and saying, like, or do you guys think you're somehow special and you can just kind of have a free-for-all going crazy? Because apparently in the Corinthian church, they were getting a little too charismatic, if you know what I mean. And so Paul is writing to them, emphasizing, God is a God of order and peace, not of disorder. Or do you think you're special? It flows perfectly if you take those verses out. So, there's the textual argument, there's the fact that those verses contradict other things he said in the chapter, in, in, in the letter. Um, if you take those out, it makes sense. The flow of the argument works better. Also, there, there's the question of two other things. When he says, uh, the end of 33b, basically, all as in all the churches. Um, well, there was only one church in Corinth. So why would he be saying, as in all the churches of the saints? Secondly, when there's that weird phrase that says they are to not permitted to speak, should be in submission, as the law says. Paul was a Pharisee. He knew his Torah. He knew his law. And nowhere in the Torah does it ever say women have to be completely silent whenever they meet. That's not in the Torah. So it would be really weird if Paul, a Pharisee, would claim something is in the Torah that isn't in the Torah. And so, you put that all together, the question about verses 34 and 35, and really 33b, 34 and 35, I think there is a good argument that those verses are not part of the original letter. It was originally written in a margin that a scribe put in the letter at an earlier time, and it just found its way into all the manuscripts that we have. Kind of interesting. All right. Well, that's the really interesting textual argument in chapter 14. The rest of chapter 14 should make fairly good sense in regard to he's focusing on prophesying and speaking in tongues and how it needs to be done in an orderly way. Now, chapter 15 is really important. Oh, this is going to be too long. Um, 15 is kind of like what it all comes down to. And in chapter 15, he talks about the importance of the resurrection of Christ and what, what that means. Um, now, his point at the beginning is, um, well, in the first part of 15, 1 through 11, he kind of gives a little background on the, the fact that Jesus really was resurrected and he really did appear to uh, a number of people to the, the apostles. He was raised on the third day. Then he appeared to Peter and to the twelve. More than 500 people at one time. Um, and then eventually to Paul himself. He emphasizes, and this is really important, he's emphasizing that the resurrection of Jesus 
was an actual physical resurrection. In the Jewish worldview, the Jewish first, first century Second Temple Judaism, resurrection by definition meant physical resurrection. Not resuscitation where you eventually die again, but the teaching of resurrection was that Jesus was, went into death, came out the other side, so to speak, to be immortal. Okay? He's not going to die again. That's what resurrection means. The transformation of the physical body to where you are not a floating spirit, but you have resurrected physically. That's, and that's the good news of the gospel, that even though you die, you will be resurrected and God's creation will be renewed. Okay? And this is what Paul is going to say. This is the importance of the resurrection. Um, therefore, apparently, and he picks this up in verse 12, there were some in Corinth who were claiming that there was no resurrection of the dead. Then he says in verse 13, if there's no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain and your faith is in vain. Remember, Corinth was a Greek city. It's a Roman city. And in Greek philosophy and Greek belief, you know, they didn't believe in a resurrection of the dead. And when Paul preaches in Athens, they laugh at him for that idea because they believe that the material world is icky and you want to shed your mortal coil and be a spirit in the ether. And obviously this view was still around in Corinth, even among some believers. That's what they grew up with. And when you think about it, even a lot of Christians kind of think that. They think Jesus rose again so we can be spirits in heaven one day. Well, that's not the Christian view of the significance of the resurrection. The significance, the Christian view is Christ was physically raised and transformed and that when he comes again, you will be physically raised and transformed. This, this stuff ain't going away. It's going to get transformed and you're going to live in God's new creation, a material reality. Um, that's why he says um, what he says here in this point. If he has not been raised, then you're going to die and wither away. You, you have no hope. That's the, the significance of the resurrection. Now, in order to do that, he kind of has to explain um, kind of the Christian understanding of everything. And he goes back to Adam. Um, now, Adam obviously is the first man in Genesis, but he represents humanity in our natural state. That's an important thing to realize. You get this in some of the early church fathers as well. Um, starting in verse 20. He emphasizes Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For as by man came death, by a man also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ all shall be made alive. What's his point? We're not going to get into the talk about original sin and whatnot. We're going to get it, keep it really simple. And this is what the early church message was. Pointing to Adam, Adam represented humanity in our natural state. In our natural state, we are going to die. Okay? That's the, we all experience it. That's the point. The original creation is uh, subject to decay and death. And Paul, and as if you read the early church fathers, they kind of say, yeah, this is God's plan all along. But that is part one. That's step one. Step two is Christ comes into that old creation, the corrupt creation, dies, transforms, resurrects, and that will lead to step two of a renewal of creation, a transformation of creation to something better. And so this is what Paul is saying. The significance of the resurrection of Christ is that everyone dies. We're all in Adam. We're, we are Adam. This is our natural state. That has to happen first in order for resurrection to happen. And then he gives the example of, um, uh, where is it? Uh, oh, oh, that comes up later. Hold on. Um, but anyway, when you read that, that is what he's, he's talking about. Um, the significance of the resurrection is a conquering of death and a renewal of creation. That's the significance of Christ being physically raised. Now, what does that mean? What's the resurrection body going to be like? Because, again, even today, a lot of people tend to think of, you know, life after death as us being like Casper the Friendly Ghost, you know, floating around in a cloud playing a harp. Paul makes it clear that that's not the Christian view. Um, he picks it up in verse 35. But someone will ask, how are the dead raised? With what kind of body do they come? You foolish person, 
What you sow does not come to life until it dies. And what you sow is not the body that is to be, but a bare kernel, perhaps of a wheat or some other grain. But God gives it a body as he has chosen, and to each kind of seed its own body. You know what I mean. You can read it. For not all flesh is the same, but there is one kind for humans, another kind for animals, kind of birds, fish. There are heavenly bodies, earthly bodies, but the glory of the heavenly is of one kind, and the glory of the earthly is another. There is one glory of the sun, and other glory of the moon and of the stars. It differs in glory. We're not going to go into that. So it is with the resurrection of the dead. What is sown perishable, what is raised imperishable. It is sown in dishonor, it is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness, it is raised in power. It is sown a natural, or what he calls a soulish body. It is raised a spiritual body. But if there is a soulish natural body, there is also a spiritual body. For it is written, the first man became a living being, the last Adam became a life-giving spirit. But it is not the spiritual that is first, but the natural, and then the spiritual. The first man was from the earth, the man of dust. The second is from heaven. As was the man of dust, so also are those who are of dust. And as is the man of heaven, so also are those of heaven. Just as we have been born the image of man of dust, we shall bear the image of the man of heaven. There's a lot to that, but it's really simple when you, when you see it in the big picture. He is saying that God's plan all along was to create nature and the natural man, the natural person, um, that's not the end product. Adam was not meant to be the end product that went bad and then Jesus comes to fix things. Um, there was a process of creation all along. What is natural, me and you and Adam and everybody, we're going to die. That's the first part. We're the seed that goes into the ground, death. Then, in Christ, new life comes about. Still a physical thing, but something greater, something transformed. Um, that's what the resurrection occurrences, uh, appearances of Christ is. They touched him and stuff, and yeah, he has a physical body, but there's something different about it. And so Paul is emphasizing that that resurrection is the first fruits of the new creation. It points to uh, the transformation of God's good creations, to something better. And that you and me and everyone, we are the natural person bound to die, but that's not the end. There is going to be a resurrection. Now, this whole idea of it, he contrasts the natural body with the spiritual body. Don't think the spiritual body means like some kind of flighty ghost. What it means, and this simple example, think of the Energizer bunny. You know, boom, 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 boom. In the natural body is like the Energizer bunny with a battery that's going to run down and die at some point. Okay? The spiritual body is more like the spirit, Holy Spirit inspired, Holy Spirit empowered body that will raise up the physical body to immortality. That is what uh, Paul is talking about, the resurrection body. That's what the resurrection of Christ indicates will happen for those who are in Christ. They're not going to be a flighty spirit. They're going to, their, re their body will resurrect and be empowered by the Spirit of God to be immortal like Christ. That is the picture he's painting of understanding the resurrection and the importance of it. And then he, when he does that, he can't but end at the very end of chapter 15 to just kind of break out in praise. You know, basically, O death, swallowed up in victory, O death, where is thy sting? Um, he's talking about what the resurrection is saying about God's creation, about even death is going to be conquered. Okay? Now... The very end of uh, chapter 16 is the very end where we're not going to spend too much time with it. But basically, it's just he mentions the collection for the saints. This is one of the things that Paul was emphasized to do with all his uh, Gentile, predominantly Gentile churches, to try to show unity with the Jewish believers back in Jerusalem. He wanted all of his Gentile churches to take up a collection to help the needy in Jerusalem because he wanted to bring... Jew and Gentile together. Um, so he talks about the collection of the saints, he talks about some of his plans for travel, he gives some final instructions, and the final greeting. Huh! Okay, that is 1 Corinthians. There's a lot there, uh, but I want you to pay a particular attention to uh, that bit about the textual problem question in chapter 14, and then the significance of his talk on the resurrection.
All right. Have fun doing those sheets and the worksheets, and I will be getting 2 Corinthians up in a few days, and we'll just keep plugging along. All right. Thanks.